Good morning, fellow classmates. My name is Brian. I'm here to help you understand what the whole idea about going out in the field to do some field herping is all about. And this morning we're going to go out and wander around, look for, look for uh, snakes, amphibians, lizards, turtles, whatever crawls is what we're going to look for. The word herpetology means the study of creepy crawly things. So likely that it, that it includes all the reptiles and amphibians. Now field herping is somewhat dependent on weather, of course. You don't want to pick a time where it's blazingly hot or terribly cold either. It kind of depends on the species you're really interested in finding. But in a general sense, uh, temperatures that are in the above 65 or so with, with sun out is, is always a very good option. Now we want to pick timing, you know, fairly early in the morning is great, kind of like with birding. Um, but with, with a lot of herps, they, they wait to come out with the sun. And they spend a night underground where they get cold and, or overly cool. They want to come out and bake and, and warm up for a while. Because reptiles really don't get activated until they get sufficient, sufficiently warm. And so once that happens, then they get started moving around. And that's the time we want to catch them, is when they're moving around. So we want to kind of time it so that they come out with the sun, they're warmed up, and we're warmed up, and so we can actually start looking around for them. Uh, it depends a little bit on, like, like I say, what, what you want to find. There are some reptiles and amphibians that enjoy cool weather. Amphibians particularly like cool weather, particularly if it's cool and rainy. <laughs> some reptiles prefer it cooler. Like garter snakes like it cooler as well. And there are other snakes like racers, common racers, that uh, appreciate much warmer temperatures because they're daytime ambush hunters. Many snakes show up in places that they're not expected to be, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's their natural habitat. But places like Chatfield State Park are a great natural habitat for many species of reptiles and amphibians that, that we know here. The idea is to go around and look in the habitat to figure out where animals might be hiding. Uh, if they're not moving around visibly, then they're typically hiding uh, underneath bushes, underneath logs, under bark, sometimes if you're a lizard, you know, you might be on the side of a, a building. Uh, you might be on the side of a, of a tree or something like that. If you hit it right in the morning when it's not too warm, but it's just warm enough, you might catch the snakes out moving around anyway because they're out starting their day looking for, looking for food or looking for mates, depending on what your motivation is at that point in time. Looking for them around bodies of water is always very good for that because not only are... are Frogs and turtles attracted to water, but snakes are too. Garter snakes especially. But animals like bull snakes and rattlesnakes are often found around water as well. Uh, many times I've seen bull snakes chasing birds in cattail marshes or rattlesnakes swimming through a pond. You know, you, all these things are possible. Sometimes evening is a great time to go out, you know, after four o'clock in the summertime. A lot of people enjoy field herping by riding, driving the roads, you know, back roads at night because a lot of, a lot of animals are more active at night on the summer, in, during the summer. And so you're likely to see them crossing the road at night because that's their activity period. You know, after a nice soaking rainstorm, it's a great time to find, you know, toads and frogs that are crossing the road and uh, salamanders as well. And sometimes um, it's possible to do field herping by using your ears. Just like with birding, you can identify species by the sounds they make. Lots of frogs and toads have their own particular sound that, that they make. Uh, they have vocals, they have different, different calls. Uh, of course, snakes don't make audible sounds, <laughs> unless they're hissing at you or something like that. And bull snakes are known for making an audible hiss. Uh, other non-venomous snakes that are vibrating their tail tip uh, in the grass, so that's something you can listen for. Um, you can also hear snakes slithering through the dry leaves too. Once you've got an idea of what that sounds like, it's very identifiable. It's like a steady state hissing sound crossing the ground. It's really cool. Uh, rocky areas is particularly good around Colorado areas at low elevation because these represent ideal hiding places that are shaded and also access to heated areas for them to warm up. Because they're not warm-blooded like we are, they have to select places in their environment to supply the temperature gradients that they really need at, at some point in time. Uh, most reptiles 
and amphibians are underground for the season, hibernating by, let's say, the end of November. On rare occasions, you might find rattlesnakes out uh, in, in through the wintertime, you know, because they, they're not st so stationary as some of these other snakes are. That's the introduction to field herbing. Sensitive to environmental. What do we have here? We have a northern leopard frog. One of the things about leopard frogs is that they have a um, they have spots, of course, just like leopards, which where they get their name. On the side of the body, there's a white line, and this is called the dorsolateral fold. You can check your field ID guides for this too. So this is a real characteristic of the identification of leopard frogs. Is number one the spots but also the dorsal lateral fold, which extends from behind the eye down to the hip. Uh, in the plains leopard frog, which is a different species found further south in Colorado, the, the uh, lateral line actually breaks off. It stops and then starts again. But this frog also has a nice, nice light-colored lips. It's got a nice white belly. Um, and this is a great frog to have around. It's a native species, so we need to have more of these around. But protected habitat is critically important to this, to this particular species. And we need to uh, basically resist the temptation to turn our bullfrog pets loose because they wreak havoc on the environment. Um, so this, this frog here should be busy laying eggs and having big egg masses. They lay eggs in a big ball of ball-shaped mass, gelatinous mass, and then they hatch out in, in about a week or so, and then tapples are free and clear to go. So frogs are uh, interesting animals in that they have an external ear opening. It's called the tympanum, and it's a disc that's right behind the eye, and this is what they use to hear things. They're incredibly good at hearing noises, particularly noises that actually um, will warn them of approaching danger, which is humans, uh, raccoons and things like that. Uh, the plains leopard frog, which is in southern Colorado, has a white dot typically in the center of the tympanum. So that's another distinguishing character of these of these particular types of frogs. Now, in the state of Colorado, uh, the species is considered a species of special concern because it's it has a trend toward declining in this state, as it is in many other states as well. One of the primary reasons it's declining is because of the presence of bullfrogs and bullfrog tadpoles. And those two things help uh, outcompete the, the northern leopard frog. Bullfrog tadpoles are probably almost as big as this frog here. Um, and so even bullfrog tadpoles can be a problem for other amphibian species as well as tadpoles of this species too. There are many other factors that contribute to the decline of leopard frogs and, and the environment and habitat is, an, is the other part of that. Uh, frogs, of course, as well as other amphibians, depend upon the permanency of, of bodies of water. And leopard frogs have particular bodies of water that they, that they breed in. They have certain bodies of water that they hibernate in because they go down to the bottom and they hibernate in the mud. So those two things are possible. They also spend a lot of time over, over land, hunting bugs and spending time in rodent burrows overnight. So you have to have a combination of many things that contribute to the habitat of this species. If you knock out some of those, those factors, then what you end up with is a slowly declining population. So maintaining habitat for this species is, is critically important, and that's the same as for virtually other, any other amphibian. They are a sensitive, sensitive type of animal to the environment. So any changes, whether it's chemical or physical alterations, are going to have some impact on these critters. He's probably going to swim right underneath something. This little toad that we found here is, is, is basically a baby woodhouse toad. It's a true toad. Um, and they're extremely common around here. They breed in the tens of thousands in, in a great number of different kinds of pools. 
They're extremely adaptable toad that's found all over the all over the continent. Um, these toads are actually, um, of course, have large paratoid glands on the back of their neck, which are kidney-shaped little raised bumps that are actually contained. They are a gland, so they contain poison. And this is what predators would encounter as they bit onto the back of the neck. Uh, there's a milky milky fluid that comes out, and it's, it's actually pretty toxic. Um, you would not want to uh, lick this toad <laughs> at all because uh, the fluids would cause you a great deal of harm. This, this little toadlet probably came out uh, last summer. And so we were lucky to find him today, as a matter of fact. He's out trying to make it, make, make it in the world and trying to, find, trying to find food. So he'll be doing this for quite a, quite a while. Uh, the warts on this animal are kind of ringed in red, which is characteristic of a young animal. As they get bigger, the warts get bigger, and then they become ringed mostly with black. So if you look in your field guide, you can see that the, this, this toad is, represents the adults in quite a bit, but it's a, it's a little bit different in terms of the red ring around the warts themselves. Um, this toad should not be confused with the plain spadefoot toad, which is also found in, now found in uh, uh, Chaffield State Park. It's a much different type of toad. It's not a true toad. Uh, it has a lot of different um, characteristics about it. It has vertical pupils, whereas this one has horizontal pupils during the day, kind of like a cat. Um, so these toads are actually found quite often all across the land uh, in, in numerous types of habitats, in forested areas as well as fields. So they're extremely numerous and you're likely to see them at all times. They are a, they are a food source for a great number of other animals too, like raccoons and uh, birds as well. So it's a, it's a, since they are produced in such high numbers, you know, it's a great food source for a great number of animals, including snakes and other frogs like bullfrogs. We'll eat, eat a lot of these too. So this is a very common toad and it's a very cool toad. It is awesome. So what we have here is a rock with a nice beautiful crack in the, and it runs horizontally. This crack serves as a very nice hiding place for snakes. And what we're looking at right here is the remains of, of a snake shed, shed. The skin has been shed within this crack because the crack helps it actually peel back the skin as it comes off. Snakes shed their skin probably once every uh, three weeks, three to four weeks, depending on the species and depending on how fast they're growing, how much food they're eating and so forth. Um, but this is a very good spot. This is probably a spot where uh, numerous snakes come to greet each other and meet each other and find mates and so forth. So this is really an, an important crack because uh, it, it serves as a hiding place and it serves as a rendezvous point for the same species. Um, there are at least two snakes that shed in this crack and the crack goes way back, way back. So a nice thin snake could find an ideal place to hide here and safe. Uh, very be, it would be very hard for a predator to get a hold of these snakes because uh, it couldn't get access to them. So I'm going to attempt to remove one of those sheds and see if we can figure out what kind of species it is. I've got to be a little, a little cautious because um, there are rattlesnakes in this area and I want to make sure that there's not a rattlesnake behind this shed. But I've looked pretty closely and I can see that there's no living snakes anywhere near. I already have a pretty good idea of what this is. So I think this is enough to look at. So basically this is kind of like a carbon copy, carbon copy of the snake itself. Uh, a lot of the dis distinguishing marks on snakes are retained in the skin layer. This is the outer skin layer. Skin is shed to, for a number of reasons. One is to accommodate uh, increased growth size and also a way to get rid of external parasites um, and also to correct any kind of blemish or uh, uh, wounds that they might have had. Every time they, they shed their skin it improves the wound and cleans it out and it gets rid of parasites like ticks and so forth which are found 
Um, so this is the ventral side of the snake, the, the belly side. The scales are elongated, different from the top of the scale, top of the uh, snake right here. Uh, these scales are all smooth; they're not keeled. Keeled scales have a have a upraised line that runs down through the center, along the lengthwise of the scale, and that's more representative of rattlesnakes and bull snakes and garter snakes. But this looks like more like to me like it's a, a northern racer, Calibra constrictor, and which is typically a snake that, as an adult, is kind of a drab brownish green. As it gets older, it turns into a coppery brown color, um, but it has no other color patterns based, uh, related to it. And then the belly is typically a whitish yellow or yellow. Uh, so it's a really uh, pretty snake. It's a very uh, fast-moving diurnal snake, so it loves heat, it loves being out in the daytime. Despite the name Calibra constrictor, which is a scientific name, it is not a constrictor. <laughs> when it eats, it captures food with its mouth and then quickly swallows it very rapidly. So it rarely ever, uh, it doesn't ever really uh, constrict its, uh, like a mouse per se. It may pin it down with its body, but it won't constrict around it like, like garter snakes do. Um, racers will eat virtually anything they can come across, including other snakes. They're real big on eating other snakes, as well as large grasshoppers. They really like those too. Um, they will take other types of rodents, frogs, and so forth. But basically anything is great if they can catch it. And because they're such a fast-moving snake, they're able to you know, catch a lot of different prey species. So we have right here is what we have is the top of the head. And these two items right here are actually the spectacles or the uh, eye caps, which are actually scales themselves, but they're highly modified to protect the eye. They're like wearing contact lenses, but they're all part of the same skin system. And they come off with the shed skin too, because there's, there's another eye cap underneath that. So this helps protect the eyes when they're crawling through cracks like that. And, um, you can see here that the top of the head, it's a little darker colored, nice smooth scales. When you have a complete skin like this, you can actually easily identify the snake species, uh, regardless of whether the snake's still in it. <laughs> so this is really awesome. Uh, there may have been a male and a female involved with this snake, with this uh, crack here, um, but there are almost no markings whatsoever, which is characteristic of, his, of a racer and the scales are nice and smooth. The snake itself would be very smooth and shiny. And the babies don't look anything like the juveniles and the juveniles don't look anything like the adults. So they go through a real interesting changeover into coloration from hatchling to adults. It's really astonishing. You would never expect it, that it was the same snake. So this, this crack is probably used on a regular basis by snakes that have used this as a signpost, a gathering place where other snakes tend to congregate. And they can leave scent trails leading up to the crack as well as in it. So this is it's a very important rock for these snakes and the whole population basically. So we don't want this rock to move <laughs> at all. Uh, that crack is very, very um, important. And basically the way the rock is facing this, to the south, this area gets heated up real nicely in the wintertime as well as in the fall. So it's a great opportunity for snakes to come hide out, warm up, and find refuge. It's perfect. Okay, here we are in the Chatfield State Park. We have a trench that's been used in the past as a rubble depository. In other words, people have thrown out uh, products of construction and so forth. But as field herpers, we have to take advantage of things like this that are found. So snakes certainly do. You know, snakes and lizards and even frogs can utilize some of these spent pieces of cement to actually find space underneath. A lot of times the cement will actually heat up too, and so when they go underneath it, they, they gain the benefits of the heated cement as well. So for field herping, you know, you take advantage of natural uh, cover as well as artificial cover like this too. Uh, and in a sense, having artificial cover here can really, really diversify the, the number of species that utilize this particular piece of land. 
and it actually encourages animals to find more hiding places, and it's a benefit, basically a benefit to them. We don't see anything, of course, today, but in some days you can find small snakes curled up underneath it. So you have to kind of think about not just big snakes, but also little tiny snakes too, because there are many species uh, like lion snakes or plains black-headed snakes that are very small, and they come up out of the ground and warm up, but they're underneath stuff. So if you have to gently peel it back and look inside underneath there, you can find them before they disappear. Sometimes snakes can be tucked on just underneath or they can be really far back in there. You just have to kind of approach it very calmly, very slowly, because they can, they can feel your vibration in the ground as you approach and they may disappear before you even know they're there. So there's a little bit of an art to it. You have to be a little stealthy and so forth. Maybe look ahead. Sometimes you can see ahead in the cracks and rocks underneath pieces of board and stuff like that to find these things. This is a very uh, difficult piece of, piece of ground to look at because there's so many places a snake can hide. And because snakes are shaped kind of like tree limbs, um, they blend in well to many things. So we have to be a little cautious, move slowly, so we don't scare them, and then they won't scare me. That's the kind of way it works. And just keep your eyes open because you never know where something might be hiding. And you want to avoid putting your hands underneath things until you're absolutely sure of what's going on. Some people use um, special gloves that repel hypodermic needles to pull rocks and sticks back. But it's all kind of whatever you want to do. And I also have, uh, have a flashlight I use. When it's sunny out, I like to use a mirror or my actual my cell phone glass to shine lights in from a distance because that's a very effective way of seeing what's deep inside a crack um, so I can anticipate it better. So I'm going to go down this way, always looking ahead. You don't often see the whole snake at once. He's coiled up into a tight ball so he can hide the best way he can. So I'm going to look under here a little bit. I'm going to peel this thing back. Nope. Nobody home there. So I'm going to push back the grass here so I can look back in there. I have found bull snakes under this before, uh, but not today. Little piles like this are really great for looking for snakes, although it can be very difficult too because it takes a little time to try to decide what rocks are better to flip over or not. And if you, whatever you can see is, is better. Um, today the sun is kind of in and out, so I might be able to use my, use my cell phone glass right now make better sense, a lot, a lot more effective that way. But just kind of, and it's, it's a great kind of light too because it's not super bright. It's a little bit diffused and it works really well. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to move this up a little bit. Knowing that there are Knowing that there are rattlesnakes in the vicinity it makes me a little bit more cautious about flipping things over until I know for sure what's going on. Nothing there. That almost looks like a snake there, right there. So this piece of plywood is really a great item for finding snakes underneath. It represents what we call artificial cover, as opposed to the tree trunks and all that, all the debris up here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to peel back slowly and look underneath it and see what's underneath. Hopefully we'll get lucky and find something, find something good. Well, 
We didn't get lucky. We have crickets and beetles. And so far, that's about it. Sometimes little tiny snakes will curl up inside the, the, the soil debris and hide. So sometimes it's useful to move the dirt around so that in case they're hiding underneath the dirt, just underneath the surface. But not today. It's also very dry. So sometimes snakes don't stay there very long when it's dry. After a rain, you know, this might be a really good place to, good thing to look underneath because there'll be moist underneath and it'll be encouraging for them to come up and spend some time above ground. Not today. There's a race runner lizard right in front of me. One of the uh, common lizards in this, in this spot. Right there. There he goes. Yeah. He's still right there. They're kind of skittish. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to hold on to him like this. So I got his legs. Uh, if you look on the side of his body, you see it a really interesting. He's got these mm -hmm. more enlarged okay. scales, which help him scoot through the ground, across the ground. There are an abundance of turtles in these ponds for sure. It's a great habitat. Mostly uh, western painted turtles and, the, and the snapping turtles as well. Occasionally you'll see also red-eared sliders, which is an invasive species native to the Midwest and East Coast area. Um, as long as red-eared sliders are not in too great abundance, um, there's usually not too much uh, problem with them, but they act, they can outcompete Western painted turtles for basking s spots on logs as well as the food, and just sheer numbers can actually outcompete and put a lot of a lot of uh, pressure on painted turtle populations. So we don't encourage people to release their pet red or sliders anywhere because they they do extremely well, and the sliders are found. In other continents as well, there's reproductive populations showing up in France, and Africa, and other other points in Europe. There appears to be a snapping turtle with his nose out of the water over over yonder, and they spend a lot of time just kind of sitting at the surface of the water, soaking up heat uh, through a thin layer of water, but also just kind of surveying the environment, see what's going on. Uh, snapping turtles, of course, are carnivorous. To a large extent, they eat baby turtles, frogs, birds, pretty much anything they can get in their mouth, including snakes um, and so forth. So they are a interesting carnivorous predator turtle to have here. Native turtle too, so that's, we're glad to have them here. So this is a common snapping turtle, so-called because he likes to snap. So. This is the only way you can handle them safely. I've got his tail and at the top of his head. But you can see this, the size of this turtle's head, he could do some real major damage to your, your body. <laughs> um, but this is one of the common turtles in Colorado. Uh, it's a turtle that spends most of its time in the water. Really only comes out of the water as females to lay eggs some distance away from the pond. But these guys will sit, they're ambush hunters, and they'll sit and uh, grab fish as they go by, or small turtles, or snakes, birds, virtually anything they can come up with. They're like um, jack of all trades. And they'll attack birds and ducks from the, below the water. If a, if a duck is kind of trundling along with babies, They'll come up from beneath the water and grab them. Um, otherwise, these turtles are, you can see that the, the back edge of the shell has, has some very distinct points. The shell itself has a ridge line that runs around this, down the center along the length of it. 
The tail is very knobby, like an alligator. In fact, in the east coast of the United States, we have the alligator snapper, which is a much bigger, huge, much bigger variety of turtle than this one is. So it's got a heavily muscular tail with knobs on the top. It's like a crocodile or an alligator. Scutes. Uh, this is not a turtle to be trifled with. Um, I was lucky enough to get him in a position where I could uh, have some control over him, but uh, these turtles live a very, very long time, and they're pretty, pretty dangerous in a sense. We'll let you go. Okay, you ready? Uh huh. Here we go. Here we go. There's your shot for naturalist. Oh gosh. That's a huge, big turtle. That is a huge. So what we have here is our native bull snake. Uh, this is one of the more popular snakes around here. They are, uh, they get a whole lot bigger than this, uh, but they're, they're big time rodent eaters and bird eaters. And so they're good to have around because they do eat a lot of rodents. Um, and they're able to get in places where rodents live. And so they can actually uh, do a number on rodents. This is a particularly yellow individual the question is, why is this not a rattlesnake? Well, it's not a rattlesnake because, number one, it doesn't have rattles on the end of its tail. As you can see, the tail ends in a very narrow, pointy tip. And um, this snake is acting very nicely. He's not trying to bite me. He just, he just likes, to, likes to get around. So, number one, the tail is pointy and without rattles on it at all. The head and neck, as you can see, perhaps you can see it better here, about the same width. So there's no big distinction between the neck width and the head width at the base of the head. And there's no white marks in the front of his face that rattlesnakes have, because they usually have two facial things like this, like war paint. But this snake does not have them. Instead, he's got black marks on the, on the lips that are vertical. So right now he's, he's trying to get away from me because he prefers to be elsewhere. <laughs> but he's actually they're pretty content because I'm an expert. And when you, when you handle them properly, they're, they're usually pretty okay. Bull snakes um, are commonly mistaken for other snakes, particularly rattlesnakes, because like, like rattlesnakes, these guys can vibrate their tail tip when they feel threatened. But basically every snake that you can think of will do that. It's not a condition uh, solely left to rattlesnakes. And they vibrate their tail tip for a number of reasons. One is to distract the predator's attention to the tail instead of to the head. And the other idea is possibly that it is mimicking a rattlesnake and that when the tail vibrates against dry leaves or other objects, that it may actually create an audible sound which, re, which is reminiscent of a rattlesnake warning. So this snake is probably three, three to four years old, uh, but they get, like I say, they get much bigger than this by far. Um, and so they scare a lot of people. But you can tell by his coloration that he's really suited toward the fields and um, bushes and things like that. So he's, he's really well adapted to that. Uh, some people call these gopher snakes, but in, from a technical point of view, gopher snakes are found west of the Rocky Mountains, and these are, these are in fact bull snakes, which is a type of gopher snake, essentially. Most of these snakes eat birds and rodents of, of various kinds. They're, they don't eat snakes, contrary to popular view. Um, they almost never eat frogs or any other kind of amphibian, but they're really situated to eat warm-blooded prey, and they will chase things down. They'll eat baby bunnies, uh, baby prairie dogs. Um, because of the way their, their head is structured, they're kind of limited to the size of prey to a certain extent. In other words, they can't spread their jaw open far enough for super large organisms, but they can eat a lot of them. In other words, this snake will go into a mouse tunnel and eat the entire contents of that tunnel. So it's an excellent mouser. The center of the scale along its longitudinal axis, you can see a little raised area. It looks like the keel of a boat. 
you look closely, you can see that it's not extremely well defined, um, but I can feel it in my hand because it makes the scales feel a little bit rougher. Rattlesnakes have highly keeled scales. It's not necessarily an indication of the kind of snake that it is because many snakes have mildly keeled scales or heavily keeled. Garter snakes have them. Bracers do not. So it seems like there's no rhyme or reason why they wouldn't, would or would not have them. Um, another interesting question you might want to think about in your, as you're pondering life is why do so many snakes have these blotchy color patterns? And why does the racer not have a color pattern like that at all? Why do some snakes have blotches and some have long lines along the length of the body instead of blotches? What advantage does that confer to the animal? Is it particular to a kind of species and a kind of behavior that they do? We don't really know is the answer to that. There are people studying this, of course. <laughs> but in one situation, we, we say, when this snake is moving along the ground, we get what we call flicker fusion. In other words, these blotches, as the snake is moving, represent like a film strip moving, which may actually just uh, distract the predator from approaching or confuse him as to how fast the snake is actually moving. It's not real clear exactly what the purpose of blotches are, but they are popular in a number of snakes. Um, so they must have a pretty good reason to be there. I think we're ready to release this guy, watch him move and as, as snakes move. Off he goes. No biting. <laughs> I know, you like to bite. All right, I think we have him like, all right. okay. constrained. He's okay, gonna, that's what I'm used to doing. He's yeah. going to stink a little bit. He's going to stink? Yeah. yeah. You can see the oh, cloacals yeah. open. Oh, oh yeah. Oh. Okay, so they have musk oh, yeah. glands like, like dogs do. Uh -huh. And okay. when, they're, when they're a little scared, they do exude a little bit of the musk. Oh this, yes, now I smell it. Yeah. Mm. Notice that the belly is relatively unmarked, mm -hmm. which not all garter snakes share. Um, you can see mm -hmm. it's pretty pungent. Yeah, it smells like uh -huh. anal gland on dogs. Oh, yeah. On dogs, yeah. it yeah. does. After you yeah. express them. And you can see that the adult snake also has a lot of little dark squares. Mm -hmm. uh, Western terrestrial garter snake shares that as well, but it doesn't have the stripes like this. Not not the orangey red stripe. His tail is very long and slender and pointy, which is different from um, a rattlesnake. All the other non-venomous snakes have long pointy tails that taper a long ways, including bull snakes. Um, notice also the head shape is, I would call it like a finger shape or thumb shape, right? But the neck is about the same width as the width of the head. It's a very distinctive character when you're comparing it to rattlesnakes. Also on the lips, Lips. Snakes have lips, by the way. <laughs> not quite like ours, but so let's just back up one little step. The snake's body is covered with scales. Scales help protect it from undergrowth, protect it from other snakes. It also helps protect them from drying out. So there are scales all over the body. There are different shaped scales. They're different. They're there for different reasons. The belly scales are long and slender. First body scale goes mm -hmm. in a diagonal. And so, unfortunately, my eyes don't focus that closely anymore. Um, should be one, two, three, and four. Scale rows three and four is where this stripe impacts. On other snakes, it might be scale rows two and three. So that's kind of a, a, a distinction. And that's how we can also key out some snakes, looking at the scale rows. Another key character to look for is the lip scales those black stripes that go down the top lips. Very characteristic of garter snakes. Uh, there are things called ribbon snakes that look a lot like a garter snake, but they don't have the, the black lines of the lips. Notice that he's also got a round pupil. Rattlesnakes, if you look really close, <laughs> uh, <laughs> You're ever feeling with your I mean, a picture. <laughs> yeah. The pupil's round, but uh, rattlesnakes and many other venomous snakes have elliptical pupils like a cat. They're vertically shaped. 